Hello, Dr. Kath here again, and we're back inside because the weather's so horrible. So today I thought we could talk about herons in Shropshire. They'd be quite a difficult thing to talk about outside because um, I can't really get a chick out of a nest and hold it up and show it you. So we're going to have some pictures instead. Now, herons are one of the most obvious birds in the countryside. There's quite a lot of them about in Shropshire. Um, they seem to be doing really quite well. Their population is very stable. Um, they're a big, tall, visible bird. And they've always been big, tall, visible birds. So historically, they've got quite a presence in the country. They used to be um, a prestige food item. They used to hunt for herons with hawks. Um, they were almost a royal food. You'd have them, the posh people would have them at banquets. And I found several recipes for them when I was uh, doing a bit of um, heron watching um, in Ellesmere Boathouse. And the best I found, I think the most telling, was one that merely said, cook as it were a bittern. Obviously, we wouldn't do any of that sort of thing these days. Um, Brian Vesey Fitzgerald in, in British Game in 1953 wrote, I have eaten heron and found it a loathsome experience, but he maybe didn't cook it right. Uh, May Byron in 1914 says, the important thing is not to break the bones because the bones of a heron have a sort of fishy fluid inside them. And she made a heron pudding and says it tastes very much like a nice meat pudding. She also points out that the fishy fluid inside the bones ought to be kept in the medicine cupboard and rubbed onto cuts and cracks in the skin. There's a, also um, the fat of a heron killed at the full moon was supposed to cure rheumatism. So lots of historical uses for heron. They've got lots of vernacular names, which shows you what an obvious and much noticed bird they were. So here's a heron. Like I say, it's a noticeable bird. It stands about a meter tall. Um, it's got these very long legs, with a long neck, and blacks and whites and greys, and you see them all over the place. It's, it's actually quite a light bird for its size. It's about as heavy as a good big oven-ready chicken like you'd have for the whole family um, on, for the Sunday lunch. They weigh between one and a half, two kilos. And they have these very large very broad wings. The wingspan is just under two meters. So when you see one flying, it has this wonderful presence. They have the, the, the head is curved back in an S shape, unlike cranes and flamingos and things that fly with the neck outstretched. All the herons have this curved in neck when they fly. And it's got this very slow flapping. They, they do about 14.2 flaps per minute. And there's a wonderful poem by um, Paul Farley, which says, it struggles into its wings, then soars sunwards and throws its huge overcoat across, across the earth. And it's a wonderful poem. The rest of it's good too. So Paul Farley, the heron, do look it up. So there's lovely slow leisurely flap and those huge wings can carry it a long distance without too much effort. Heronries, we've got about 17 in Shropshire. These are the communal nesting places of herons. For it's a bit legged nesting in the tops of trees, but this is what they do. Gather in colonies. Some of the heronries are quite close together. As you can see, we've got the one up to me. It's only about maybe four miles from the nearest one. 
which is at Halston. So quite closely packed together. And the number of pairs in them fluctuates. It's usually somewhere in the low to mid teens around here, but they've been recorded with many, many more. Uh, the largest in the United Kingdom at the moment has over 100 nests. And one was recorded in Sussex that had 400 nests in it. That was in 1840. The highest documented number in a single tree was 25 nests. So it had to be a damn big tree for that. The distribution is rather uh, dictated by the availability of um, food sources close by uh, and, and the richness of those sources. So as long as there's enough food, the herons will get together in large numbers. Of course, we're lucky here in Ellesmere. We've got this colony of herons that nest on Moscow Island in the Mere. And this is a view from the boathouse um, restaurant and cafe over the onto Moscow Island. Moscow Island is a, a man-made island. It was uh, built in 1840 with spoil removed um, when they were terracing the gardens of the of the um, Ellesmere House, which was the home of Duke Bridgewater. And he had people push wheelbarrows across the ice and dump the soil in a big heap. And then, of course, as the ice melted, it sunk and it made the island. And trees have grown on it and it's the perfect place for the herons. It being close, to, it, 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 the heronry itself was established in about 1975. And because of its accessibility and its viewability from the boathouse, what was the visitor centre before it was taken into the boathouse and the boathouse was extended, um, the RSPB established um, a sort of focus on Heron's thing there. And that became Ellesmere Heron Watch. It now runs from the boathouse. It's a standalone project. It's, it's not a wildlife trust thing, but it's been going for over 30 years now. And it's a brilliant chance to actually see the herons really well. Not only do we have telescopes that you can look through, but also um, cameras onto the nests. So it's a good chance to get a good close look at what herons are doing in the nests. And because they're usually in the tops of trees, it's very difficult to see otherwise. So do get along and have a look at it because it could be your best chance to get close and personal with a heron. You really don't want to get this close and personal to a heron without having a screen in between you because they're aggressive, they're very defensive of their nests and not only can they poke you in the eye with a very sharp beak, but they can also throw up all over you, um, which is an unpleasant very fishy experience. So go down to the boathouse and see them on the cameras. It saves you having to wash all your clothes three times afterwards. So there they are breeding in the trees. And because we've been watching them, Heron Watch has been watching them for over 30 years, we've got a very good idea of what they're up to there. The male herons arrive first, sometimes in January. Early, they're very early breeders. They do this so that when the chicks hatch is hopefully when the frogs are coming to the water to breed and there's a good availability of small prey suitable for the chicks. And here is a heron in its full breeding glory. They have this wonderful plume on the back of the heads. The, the beak blushes red and they grow sort of long plumes on their fronts. So the herons will arrive and the males will choose their nests. They select a nest and stand around in it, basically just waiting for the females to arrive. So they pick the best one they can find and they hang around waiting for the females. Here is one hanging around waiting for a female. Of course, this early start is a bit of a gamble. They, in a good year, they have good feeding for the chicks and they do very well. But 
they're still in danger of gales, which we've had this year. One of the nests that there was a camera on from Heron Watch was actually blown out of the trees. And also we can still have some very bad weather. Um, in 2013, when the Wildlife Trust first started having a presence in the boathouse, we had the herons were established on nests. And then towards the end of March, we had very heavy snowflow, snowfall. It's 23rd, 25th March, that sort of time. And the nests ended up looking like giant snowballs. It was really cold, really wet, and the snow lay a long time. Of two of the nests on the cameras, one of them lost all its eggs uh, from the cold, and one of them was left with two, which then were brooded, but really failed to get anywhere. Nests, the eggs and young chicks at that time, very, very prone to chilling. Herons tried again, but by that time it was late in the season and really there was no success at all. Chicks were hatched, but um, possibly because of the stress caused by this, um, two of there were two chick, the chicks in a nest were actually um, killed by a different pair of herons. And it was it was all rather grueling because you could see it all on the big screen. And I was there talking to children about it and saying, look, his, 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 I thought the adult bird was coming in to feed them. And I said, look, coming in to feed the chicks. And in actual fact, it attacked the chicks and threw them around the nest like rag dolls and then pitched them out of the nest. So it was all very, very unpleasant. Um, so that's that's the gamble. It's possible that in a bad year like that, really, you can have no success at all. But in a good year, it does work. Herons are highly territorial birds. So part of the problem for them breeding is once the male has arrived at the nest, he is defending it as his space. So when the female arrives, he actually greets her with aggressive displays. And these ritualized displays are a way that herons avoid fighting. They have been witness fighting, they've been witnessed trying to drown each other even, but this breaks down the aggression thing and allows the pair bond to form. So this is the snap display at the top when they clap the beaks and the aggressive upright display you see with the with the plumes raised. Um, the one at the bottom is is its, its sunning position. They do this this sort of with the with the wings out thing, and this is the stretch display. And they go from the top left here and crouch the neck down between the shoulder blades. And we see this on the nests a lot. This is um, starts out as an aggressive display. Uh, the female will come to the nest and be driven off two or three times maybe. And eventually she stays longer and longer and is accepted by the male as a suitable mate. This posture will be repeated through the breeding season almost as a greeting, but it is in essence um, the remnants of, of an aggressive posture. Heron nests are all a good, good even by this 25 and one tree, they're all a good peck distance away from each other because herons really quite antisocial birds. They don't get on really very well at all. So they do a lot of this posturing, which can be quite spectacular really, and clap the beaks to each other and, and all that sort of thing. Once the pair has formed, they'll refurbish the nest a bit. They like to reuse an old nest. The nests are very large, about the size of a Chesterfield armchair. They have a lot of sticks in them. And if they have to start from scratch, it can take them up to a month to get a, a suitable nest together. So the male heron brings in twigs and offers them to the female, who then adds them to the nest as she thinks fit. And sometimes he brings in a pretty good twig like this one. 
a slightly less good twig. And sometimes he comes in with a little tiny one and it looks like he's picked it up at the petrol station on his way home. And she looks at him as if to say, what am I meant to do with that? That's really not a very good twig at all. But this is what they do. They fiddle with sticks. They steal sticks out of other herons' nests if they get a chance. Um, if it's not a good year for sticks, they can have trouble finding enough. This year has been quite good. We've had so many gales, plenty of sticks about, but quite a lot of the herons are having to do quite a lot of refurbishment and a lot of rebuilding. <clears throat> so here they are. See, the one on the left has its crest up in the slightly aggressive display, and the male behind has brought in brought in the stick as if to say it's an appeasement, you know. We've I've brought you a stick, look here, isn't it nice? These ones are only really just starting making a nest. The two herons on the nest, it is now their territory. They're defending it, and it'll take quite a long time after the pair bond has formed before they actually mate maybe six seven days this sort of time getting used used to each other getting rid of all that aggression and defensive thing working on the nest enforces the pair bond and eventually they they will properly get together and mate and the first egg will be laid two or three days after mating. The eggs are laid maybe two, three day intervals, usually, sometimes, sometimes only one day, but usually there's two or three days between them. And brooding starts from the laying of the first egg. So it's incubated right from the beginning. The eggs are surprisingly small for a bird of that size. This is a replica egg, obviously, and here it is next to it. This is a medium sized hen's egg, so it's not a huge egg. And the chicks, when they hatch, are really quite tiny. Um, also, pretty ugly. <laughs> they could be prehistoric, don't they? Um, you can imagine you, the birds being descended from dinosaurs. They really are. These ones look like baby pterodactyls or something. But there they are, little tiny things. They take 25 to 26 days to hatch. And of course, because the first egg is incubated right from laying, the first egg will hatch and the chick will be there in the nest with the remaining eggs, which will hatch in succession at two or three day intervals. And that's important when it comes to the, the feeding of the chicks. The chicks will be brooded for 10 days or so because at this stage, they're not capable of keeping themselves warm. They need to be sheltered from rain and from hot sun. As they get a bit bigger, they'll be constantly guarded. One of the parents will be at nest at all times for a further couple of weeks. The herons take turns in brooding. While they're away from the nest, they feed themselves. And if there's chicks in the nest, they collect food for the chicks. They don't feed the brooding partner. So they can be sitting for a very long time without food and waiting for the other partner to come in and change over with them. After about two weeks, when the chicks are big enough to defend themselves, both of the parents will go out and forage. Um, they will come back and spend some time standing on the nest. They'll shelter the chicks from the sun with their wings. They'll shelter them from rain. But once the chicks, which grow very quickly, get to a certain size, they must be really quite uncomfortable to sit on. Um, they, they, sort of spiky sort of things anyway. And they do grow very fast. So this one is um, maybe four or five weeks old. And doing pretty well so once they fledge after maybe eight weeks or so and these ones are known as branches it's the, the technical name for a young heron that has its feathers but is still hanging around on the nest 
And at this stage, they'll climb around in the tree and exercise themselves and flap their wings and um, come back to the nest periodically where a parent will return and feed them. And even once they're flying, for a couple of weeks, they will return to the nest um, to sleep and to be fed. But they have to get out and teach themselves how to fish. The parents don't teach them, they have to learn it all themselves. So once they're up and about and they've left the nest, there is no family contact. You'll sometimes see youngsters hanging around together, but the parents have left them. They've just, they've gone and that's it. Immature herons have this sort of greyish look all over. They don't have the white plumage. They don't have the black wing, wing patch on the shoulder. And they just look a bit sort of grubby by comparison to a fully grown heron. This one in its first winter is, um, it's had a partial molt, but first winter is very difficult for survival. They've got to have learned to fish well. It's why late broods are really at a tremendous disadvantage because they haven't had the time for learning and they haven't really had the time to feed themselves up well and put on enough weight to survive the winter. Herons from Shropshire don't migrate. Um, some of the herons down in the south of the country um, hop over to France or um, you know, the near continent, but the ones around here will stay fairly local. They'll, they might move up to the coast if there's open water is frozen, because at the coast it's all because it's salt water, it's always um, there's something available to eat. They can always eat crabs and prawns and this sort of thing, but they won't actually migrate. So what are they doing to get their food? Obviously, those chicks are taking a lot of feeding. They have to feed themselves the rest of the year as well. Well, we all know herons are master fishermen. They're also pretty opportunistic. These are grey herons we're talking about. They're the most common species, the largest of And they're the one people have problems with at their garden pond. Um, as far as a heron is concerned, a garden pond is like a bird table. It's a small bit of water with a naturally large amount of unnaturally brightly coloured fish. So as far as a heron is concerned, it's absolutely wonderful. So they have a couple of different ways of fishing. Sometimes they just stand and wait and they have that tremendous patience. You'll see them standing absolutely motionless. When they see a fish, they will coil their neck back. They have special muscles in the neck, so it can act like a spring, and they do this lightning dart to grab the fish in the water. Anglers had all sorts of theories about them. Uh, I think it was jealousy because herons actually, because it's how they make their living, they have to be very good at fishing. And they, anglers had all sorts of theories about how they caught fish, like they wiggled their toes in the water to look like worms, um, that oil leaked from their legs, which acted as a, an attractant, and even that their powder down was luminous so they could fish at night. They do fish at night, but they don't have luminous down. Um, they're all, their legs don't leak and they don't really wiggle their toes much. Um, but um, green herons, we don't have in this country, but they have been seen actually using lures for fish, which is um, tool usage is very uncommon in, in birds. And, it's sort of picking uh, a flower or something like this, dropping it in the water so that the fish will come and maybe have a nibble at it and then the heron can grab the fish. So it's, it's, it's not that unlikely, but um, let's not believe the wiggling toes, eh? Anglers also made a very unpleasant bait um, using basically fermented heron bowels and a spoonful of asafoetida. And once it was, it, apparently it would turn into the consistency of honey, which you could then smear over your fishing tackle. 
Um, it must have smelled absolutely disgusting, but apparently it was extremely efficacious in the west of Ireland. Um, obviously not something we'd really want, want to try. Um, and anglers would also carry a, a heron's foot in their pocket uh, in the hope that the, um, the success of the heron would rub off on the angler. When they're not fishing, they will stalk through meadows and pick up frogs and beetles and worms and all sorts of things. So they are opportunistic. Um, they'll paddle through water. This is a marvellous time lapse thing. They paddle through water and catch things they've disturbed. They'll either grab or stab the fish and then juggle it into a position that it'll go swallowed whole head first. They also eat a range of other things. They'll eat um, ducklings, water voles, rats, eat things as big as moorhens. Um, there is a report of a semi-tame, shall I say, young heron, which has probably been fattened up for dinner, uh, eating a Persian kitten and of another one hunting rats in a barnyard. They generally, with mammals and things, they will dunk them in the water, if not actually drown them. They actively drown things like that, hold them down under the water, and then when they're nice and wet, arrange them so they're going head first down the neck so that the fur and feathers don't catch in the throat. As you can see, they have quite a good sized beak for catching anything. The beaks are interesting. They're specially adapted for catching fish. This is a, the, the, the skull of a heron, um, very large beak compared to the, the size of the head. And in close up, you can see it's toothed. So you can grab a fish and it can't slither away. They spend a lot of time preening as well. They have to keep the plumage in good order. And if you're spending your time mucking about in the water, which is what they do, and catching slippery fish and things. You get fish scales, fish slime, pond weed, all sorts of things all over your feathers. So they do spend a lot of time preening. They have powder patches, powder down patches. They have six of them. Other birds do have them, but herons are particularly well endowed with them. So they have these Powder down is, 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 is like a normal down feather that birds use for insulation, but it also it breaks up and it makes a sort of talc that they can rub over their faces and necks from the powder patches on their bodies. And it absorbs the, the fish goop, the, the fish slime and and the wetness and things like that, and they can then groom it off themselves with their beak or with their feet. And they have a specially adapted claw. This is called a pectinate claw, and it has a comb on it, so they can comb their feathers with it and groom out that powder down, which has absorbed all the, the fish slime and things. Um, so they keep the feathers dry and they keep them clean. Marvellous adaptation for lifestyle. These things are tremendously good at what they do. I think grey herons are absolutely marvellous. We are gradually getting other species of herons in this country. We've always had bitterns, but with a climate changing, everywhere getting warmer. We're beginning to see great white egrets, um, not breeding in this country yet, but we increasingly see them around the mere, um, particularly in winter. Little egrets, these are marvellous, aren't they? They've got the, the wonderful black legs, the same as the great white egret has, but they've got these yellow feet. They always make me think they're wearing little rubber gloves or something. Um, these are much smaller and they, are breeding in heronries in the south of the country. Herons on the continent 
I've seen them in, in places like the south of France and in Spain. Herons are, like I said earlier, communal nesters, but they also are mixed communities. So you get all sorts of herons joining in all together. So you'll get a big heronry that has grey herons, great white egrets, little egrets, uh, cattle egrets, um, all of the tree nesting herons, all together, uh, ibises and all sorts of things, all together in the same tree. And it's really quite spectacular. So who knows, there might be hope for it. We even get spoonbills coming through Shropshire now. Marvellous. So occasionally they would have been seen at, um, at Wigsell Moss and at, at, at Wood Lane. One actually arrived at the Charles Sinker Fields just as we were um, having a meeting to celebrate the Wildlife Trust's improvements there. So fabulous things to see. And who knows, they could be getting more common. Bitterns, another of the heron family, these are chunkier things, much smaller bird than a, than a grey heron, and they don't have a very obvious um, S-bend to their neck because they've got a much stockier neck. Um, these are, do breed throughout the country, but they have very specific requirements. They're not tree, men, tree nesters like the, um, like the herons, and we won't find them in, um, in the mixed colonies. They need to have very large areas of reed bed. And of course, we just don't have suitable habitat in this county in Shropshire. But you can see them at Leighton Moss and um, of course, lots of them in Norfolk and Suffolk in the Fens and down in Somerset now. Um, they're improving the habitat there, improving the reed beds. And in the usual way, if you build it, they will come and herons, uh, sorry, bitterns are being heard booming. They have this wonderful territorial um, and courtship cry the, 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 from the males, this marvellous booming sound um, by counting the number of booming bitterns, they know how many territories are being held and how many nests are possibly being um, possibly succeeding. Bitterns have particularly large feet. They like to climb about in the reed beds um, much more. Um, they, they nest in the reed beds. They're much more um, stuck on the ground than herons are. You won't see them in the trees, but to see one flying is amazing. And you never know. Enough reed bed development and we might get bitterns here. We might get the egrets nesting here. Wouldn't that be a sight? I can just imagine looking out from the boathouse at the uh, Moscow Island and not only seeing grey herons, but also little egrets, great white egrets nesting in the trees there, which would be a real treat and um, a small compensation for the problems that climatic change might bring to us. Of course, herons won't survive and proliferate unless they have adequate habitat. If there's enough habitat, numbers will increase, breeding will succeed. In bad years, um, if there's food shortages, one of the points of having that um, spaced hatching of the chicks Remember, the eldest chick is probably two or three days older than the next one. They could have a clutch of four. four. So the smallest one is going to be over a week younger than the eldest one. So you end up with a big, big chick, middle chick, middle chick, little chick. In a good year, when there's enough food, they'll all survive. The eldest chick is always the best at getting the food. They shove the others aside, they beg loudest, the, the parents feed that one first. In a bad year, you end up with one big chick, maybe two big chicks, and the others just haven't survived. It's a safety mechanism. Quite a few birds, the owls will do this too. Um, it's not 
necessarily that they're looking at the um, the chicks that don't survive as a food source, so they have been known to eat them. Um, they're doing is ensuring that at least one survives. Herons can live a long time. They can they can breed for you know maybe twenty years. So as long as each pair produces two chicks to adulthood to breeding in that time, the population is stable. If there's enough habitat and enough good food, the population will rise. So they're hedging like they make the effort to lay four eggs, but they don't necessarily expect them alive. The best thing we can do to help them, obviously we can't, if there's bad weather, we can't go out and feed them on fish fingers or anything. They have to get on with it themselves. The best thing we can do is to make sure that the habitat is suitable, that there's healthy rivers, healthy ponds, healthy mixed grassland with damp bits in it where the frogs will be, and plenty of resources for the herons. Best way you can do that is to join the Shropshire Wildlife Trust. We're looking after habitat all over the county, over 40 reserves, and offering lots of places, lots of clean water. The land and water team are busy making sure the rivers are healthy, the ponds are healthy, there are more ponds, more wetlands, more places for herons to feed. So the best thing you can do for them is join Shropshire Wildlife Trust. It's you can join as a family for as little as five pounds a month and really make a difference. So have a think about that. And also have a think about popping up to Ellesmere. It's not that far from anywhere in Shropshire. Um, and have a look at the herons there, because it's, as I said, it's your best chance to see one really close and personal. And come along, there'll be volunteers there. Um, I'll be doing some of it myself. And they can tell you all about what the herons are doing, how the herons are doing. Have a look on the website and come and support us because Heron Watch, as I say, it's a standalone charity and we rely on visitors to come and visit and come and see the herons and enjoy it with us. So two things for you to do, two things to think about, visiting the herons and joining Shropshire Wildlife Trust. And go out there and meet a few herons. Thank you very much.